Greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome to, depending on wherever you may live, the middle of the night or early morning bonus upload. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch is displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. Finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost a cent. Click that like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to tonight's middle of the night or early morning bonus upload, shall we? All right, everybody. Um, Tonight... I have a good friend of mine, um, he is a narrator as well, but he's also a friend of mine from Maine, um, his name is Chaos Theory Production, uh, I'm not going to give you his real name because that's his choice, if he wants to share that he will, uh, he is going to be sharing his Bigfoot um, encounter that he had with us when he was a child also it would mean a lot to me if you guys went over and checked out his channel uh called chaos theory production uh he does fan fiction um he's does a lot of podcasts he's got a couple podcasts about uh ufos and alien existence Uh, just an all-around great guy and um, uh, it's a pleasure to have him on tonight. Chaos, how are you, brother? I'm all right, brother. How you doing? Very Hello, good. everybody. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Ah, it's uh, it's an honor, and it's been a long time coming. So, um, now, when did you have your encounter? How old were you? Well, uh, I was 19 at You were 19, time. okay. Um, and just just for context, I don't... I have talked about this before. I'm generally still kind of little there about talking about it. I mean, even though I did do a story of my of it on my channel, it I guess it's just one of those things you feel weird talking about something like that. I mean, I, I couldn't. I can totally understand why people have encounters like this and don't want to say anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. I do. I do. That's why I try to keep an anonymity and respect is because I think that's key to getting people to share their encounters is honoring those two things. You know, who am I to debate whether it happened or not? And who am I to share where it happened or your name and this and that? So uh, I'm going to give you the floor for a little bit and um, you can share with everybody your encounter. All right. Well, uh, just to kind of set the story, this happened in 1998. Uh, It was a long time ago. And... I just want to make it clear that this was during moose hunting season. And I've never really been a big hunter. I'm, I guess I'm the type of person that I'm going to go into the woods with, with, a, with a rifle and I'm going to find a spot and sit and wait. And I'm probably going to fall asleep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> I don't know how this came together. I, I don't know the details. I've never known. And, I, and honestly, that's part of the story that I just, you know, I'm not... I'm not going to put too much time into it, but a buddy of mine and his dad, they go moose, they went moose hunting up Maine every single year, and they've always shot moose or deer or whatever. And uh, they asked me, they say, hey, you know, you got your hunting license, you want to go with us? And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, I, I wasn't necessarily going up to go and shoot something. I was going up just because I love the woods. I grew up in, you know, in, in Maine here. So it's, even in the area that I lived in, 
at that time, you know, growing up as a kid, there weren't a whole lot of houses. I mean, I lived in a development in the south of the town that I live in. And, you know, it was just a nice place. I grew up playing in the woods with my friends and all that. So to get a chance to really go into the wilderness, uh, yeah, why not? Why wouldn't I? It would be a nice vacation for a weekend. Right. And uh, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? I just agreed with you, absolutely. So uh, the only thing that I knew of, and I I didn't realize it, and I, I still, even though I've looked at it on paper, but we have two, I guess, mountains, not really big mountains in this state, but <clears throat> they're both called Elephant Mountain. And anybody, you can fact check me totally. It's it's totally fine, you know. Um, but you've got one that's near Moosehead Lake, and then you've got one in Oxford County. And there's a big difference because I've had people be like, dude, Oxford, Maine? I'm like, yeah, there's a city and a county. I mean, you know, we do that stuff up here. Uh, so... As far as I knew, we were going up in Ox, uh, up in the deep woods in Oxford County, and so I hunkered down into the back of my, you know, buddy's dad's Bronco, and I pretty much slept the whole way. It was like four and a half, five hour drive. So we get up there, and I'm waking up because the Bronco's bouncing. It's one of these old type of, you know, we're talking like late '70s, early '80s Broncos, big one. You know what I mean? Big comfortable thing. And I'm waking up, and we're going down what was, I guess, was like a log access road or something like that. It was this little dirt road out in the middle of nowhere. And he turns down what looks like a trail. Didn't even think that we could get this vehicle down there, but he did. And we're coming up on, the, we, we stop at this little cabin. And the best way that I can describe it is if you've ever seen the Evil Dead movies, that's kind of what the cabin looked like. So it's the first thing that pops into my head. I'm like, great. You know, we're going to find demons out here. Awesome. Um, so we get, out of the, we get out of the Bronco, and the biggest thing that I noticed was the fact that it was just silent. It was just, it's just nature, dude. I mean, it's, it was beautiful and wonderful, but very intimidating at the same time because if anything ever happened... It's only the squirrels in the trees are going to hear you scream and everything else is going to run away. And, I mean, you know, we get into the cabin and, you know, it, it, there was some, you know, it required some cleanup. Let's just say that. We cleaned it up. We got it ready to go. Got our stuff unpacked. And, you know, we probably it was, you know, later afternoon in the day. So we had, a, you know, like a couple hours, two or three hours worth of daylight left. And, you know, my buddy's dad, ex-Vietnam vet, military guy, so he, like, was like Davy Crockett, man, boom, gone. Didn't even hear him, see him, nothing for a couple hours. Well, my buddy at the time <clears throat> was a very large man, like 300 and some pounds, so he wasn't going to walk very far, so probably maybe a quarter of a mile, probably uh, maybe half of a quarter of a mile away from the cabin, we see this little area where there's a log and there's some thicket. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know what a thicket is, it's basically like thick brush, some, maybe some thorny bushes, but the way that it was set up was that you had this log and a thicket and there was some spots that you could pretty much kind of put a gun barrel and a sight through and maybe, maybe 50 yards ahead of that, there were game trails where, you know, if you went out and looked, we could see there were tracks and there were plenty of moose tracks. So we're in the right area. And then we go back to the cabin we find out where we're going to you know, how we're going to set this up, go back to the cabin, you know, get something to eat and go to bed early and wake up, uh, you know, at the butt crack of dawn, man. You know what I mean? Go out there and we're sitting there. Um, my buddy's dad takes off again. Who knows where he went? And so my buddy and I are sitting on this log and we're just kind of talking quietly amongst ourselves. And it got to the point where you're hearing, like, the sun is just barely barely peeking over, you know, sunrise is starting, I guess is the best way that I can put it. So you're starting to get very early bird songs along with crickets. You kind of have that thing going on. And from way far off, you can hear something coming. And my buddy starts to get excited because, you know, it sounds like it's big and it's heavy and it sounds like there's a moose coming. It wasn't quite like a deer. And it probably, I don't know, the whole, the whole experience took maybe 20 seconds. And it felt like it was longer, but the experience leading up to it was maybe 15 minutes, you know? So you, I'm hearing this thing coming, 
And I'm no hunting expert, but it didn't sound like four legs to me. And I'm like, dude, listen. I'm like, that doesn't sound like four legs. He's like, what are you talking about? He goes, you didn't even hunt. And I'm like, all right, I'll shut up. You know what I mean? Whatever. But that's when you start getting this, like, you know, the breeze is coming at us. And it must have been coming from behind whatever was coming because there was this stink that just started getting stronger and stronger. And it was kind of like, if you want to take a musty basement, times that by 50 with a urine smell. And that's when it was almost on top of us. You know what I mean? Where it was really loud, crashing through the brush. And next thing I know, this giant hairy thing just pow, right there in front of us. And I'm talking 20 to 25 feet in front of us. And... I don't know. It's even hard for me to wrap my head around what I saw now because I didn't really know what a Sasquatch was. You know, I, I, of course, there's, the only thing you have was the gimbal film, and I don't even, or the Patterson film. Um, I don't even know if I'd seen it at that point in time, but next thing I know, there's this straight up flipping monster in front of me. And I mean, I'm sitting down, so this thing looks like it's 10 feet or higher, and it's shoulders. That's what it looked like. Um, and most definitely hair, I don't know, maybe six to eight inches long. And it's just, ah, muscled. Like the deltoids on this thing were like the size of my head. So, you know, a lot of stories that you hear about these creatures, that's 100% true. I mean, this thing was just massive, this weird cone shaped head, which was kind of rounded off at the top. Um, was there any, was there any, uh, was there any patches of hair missing or anything like like its chest? Was that lacking in hair or was it fully covered for what you could see? Well, here's the weird thing about that is that most definitely it, it almost kind of looked like this giant massive creature in a ghillie suit. But when you're talking like, and I can only speak from my experience. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not trying to take away from stories other people have had because from what I met, from what I've heard and what I've, you know, these, these creatures are almost like us in a way. They all look different in little variations. Um, there were no hair, there was no hair on the face. So, you know, when you see pictures or videos that are actually authentic, I can understand because looking at this thing, the hair around the face will give it this natural shadow, so it's really hard to see a face, but this thing was so close to us, you could see it, you couldn't not see it. Um, as I remember, the chest was a thinner in hair than the rest of it, um, as well like the palms of the hands. And it, the thing is, is that this thing came walking through and it stopped, and it turned its whole upper body and just looked down at us and snorted. You know what I mean? Yep. And, you know, he's looking at me, I'm looking at him, and the thing was is the eyes. You know, the biggest thing that I tell people that really, really struck me, other than the size of this thing, you know, what did the nose or the teeth or the lips look like? It's the eyes, dude. Big, round, like headlight, old-style headlight eyes is the best way that I could describe it. But it's looking at me and it's thinking. Like, you can just tell that there's this intelligence that it... It's not some mindless creature like, say, maybe a deer that looks at you or, you know, it wasn't a reactive type of sense. It's like, you know, I'm sitting here pissing myself literally and this thing's looking at me, studying me just like I'm looking at him and studying him. The only difference was is I don't think there was any fear in his eyes or face like there was on mine. Yeah, I'd never seen anything like this before. I grew up watching monster movies as a kid and I'm looking at one right in front of me. <laughs> You know, it's, and that, and that's the thing, you know, it's just like, I think that encounter itself, that whole encounter maybe took 20 seconds. Cause I think we spent more time, you know, looking at each other and trying to figure out what was going on. Now, mind you, my buddy right next to me is shaking like a leaf. Like he still won't talk about this to this day. I was like, Hey, do you remember that time? He's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, and I guess maybe in times, it was kind of traumatic, I guess you could say, you know, seeing something like that, and that may be an understatement, but um, <clears throat> a motorcycle right here, if you hear that, you know, but, uh, so, this thing looks at us, and, and my buddy is shaking like a leaf, he's got, he's got a 30-40 Craig sitting on his lap, 
which is, in case most people don't know, that's a very high, big caliber rifle. Um, and he's shaking, and he's starting to raise it up off his lap, and I just kind of put my hand on it and the barrel, like, on his lap. I'm like, don't, just don't, don't do it. And he just, you know, we're staring at him, he's staring at us, and then it kind of just straight up ends. You know, this thing turns its whole upper body and just continues to walk. And literally, two or three strides, and this thing was in the deep brush and gone. You know, it's it's like I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, when you're dealing with a creature like this, that you're in its living room. And that's kind of what it was. It's like you walking across your living room, like a couple steps, boom, and it's gone. Maybe... 15 seconds after that hit my buddy and I are looking at each other and we're like what in the hell and this thing just lets out this just vocalization this yell and literally something like that chills you to the bone I don't know how far away it got but I can tell you right now that this thing it, it felt like it was literally yelling in my ear it was so loud so loud so I'm going to give you something that I didn't put into the video I made of the story on my channel. All right. And I think it was maybe more for continuity. Because let's face it, I mean, I've, I've had many people come and comment on, on that story. And I've gotten rid of those comments because I don't want negativity of any kind. I mean, who does on their stories, you know? Right. Some thrive on it. Some don't want it. Um, I've gotten rid of those comments where they're like, that's not true, don't lie, that type of thing. And you're going to get that. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm very sure that you face that in the line of work that you're doing. But yeah, I, I didn't put this in the story because I, I think at that point I wanted... This happened, but when you're doing stories like this, if you put too much into it, it can sometimes sound far-fetched. One, uh, well, actually not one of, but many people, researchers that I've talked to and, and have listened to and whatnot have said, not only do you have to worry about the one in front of you, but it's the ones that you can't see behind you or around you. Yeah. Now, a after this thing vocalizes and yells, maybe another few seconds after that, probably, it, it seems like it was probably maybe 50 yards behind us. It was really close. It was almost like the woods exploded, hoots and hollers and vocalizations, and it sounded like a Mack truck just busting right through. And him and I, I turn around and look in time to see very vague shapes dashing the way that this thing went, which leads me to believe that this big boy that was out there was not the only one out there. And from some reports that I've heard in digging into, I want to say lore, and I hate to use that word, but I don't really know a better word to use at the moment, that they'll be kind of like a hunting party. They will space themselves out maybe 50 to 100 yards, even though they know they're there. I guess that's the whole point of using vocalizations and tree knocks and all of that type of thing. You know, it, it, just, it just blows your mind. It really does. I mean, like, even now, being 43 years old, and I was 19 when this happened, uh, dude, I, I, I know what I saw. I know that I didn't dream it. I know that I'm not making it up. But it's still really hard to wrap your mind around something like that. I mean, even now, I've seen weird lights in the sky. I, I've dealt with, I grew up in a haunted house. My grandparents' house was haunted growing up. You know, when you're when you're dealing with something like that, and you see something like that. If you do, if you're dealing with it a lot, it can kind of somewhat reach a norm. Right. But when you do, when you deal with something like this, this is just completely different. So I know that in my own personal experience, those people who have seen creatures like this, whether it be a Sasquatch or a Dogman, I can relate in the sense that it's just like doesn't matter if it happened yesterday don't it doesn't matter if it happened 20 years ago you still don't have an explanation you know what you saw you know what happened but you know does it make any sense i mean <laughs> i don't know if i'm describing it properly but yeah it's, just that it's actually i talk about it all the time on the channel is you know no matter what 
time limit is between your encounter and now, it's always because our brain is is told to that these things don't exist. We're told these don't exist by our parents, unless you've got really cool parents, um, by society and books, everything that, you know, there is nothing out in those woods that except bears and, you know, the natural animals. Um, so when we have these encounters, it stays with us for the, for the long run, pretty much. You're not forgetting it no matter what. And uh, it's definitely a, a PTS, PTSD causing. So um, when it did that vocalization, when it roared, how did your chest, did you feel like the, the vibrations in your chest? Can you explain? Like, yeah, you know what's funny is I can give you the perfect explanation for something like that. And growing up, if, if anybody who's ever sat, <clears throat> excuse me, if, any, if there's anybody who's ever sat in a car that has a really massive sound system in it, I mean, I myself personally, you know, up to that point and beyond it, had always had very big sound systems in my car because that was the thing to do. That's what I liked. But just to, the best way that I can relate that, what I felt, because it, it literally it vibrates you from your head to the top of your head to your toenails is that if you're sitting in the back seat and you've got a couple of big 12 inch subs or whatever in the right behind you and the way it just vibrates your whole body, you can feel it right in your chest cavity. That's kind of exactly what it, what it feels like. And here's the weird thing about that. And I didn't, I didn't really put two and two together until I had heard other people's stories and be like, okay, you know what? I, I can, I can relate to that because that's kind of what happened to me was the fact that, it kind of, in a weird way, makes your head a little woozy. Right. I don't know if that's the right word, but it, it's it's something that kind of messes with your vision. It messes with your your senses. You know what I mean? Your hearing and your even so much your sense of smell and taste. You know what I mean? It like it, it's you know really really bad cotton mouth that literally dried me right out. Wow! It, it's it's almost like it had this. <clears throat> almost had like this ultrasonic type of effect. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if I'm describing it properly. No, I, I, I can kind I, of only go in my own words on how that felt. I think people are going to get the gist of it. I really do. Like it just, it has its effect on your five senses, except touch and, you know, pretty much your hearing, vision, smell, taste, everything is just affected because... It's like you said, ultrasonic or something, you know, you're it probably the vibrations in like the bass probably does something to your brain, you know, and it probably screws that up for a little bit, too. Yeah, almost kind of makes your heart skip a beat, literally. Right. You know, it's it's and I've heard stories and it makes sense in a way because I've heard stories of people that have been unlucky enough to be around these things when they're hunting yep. and they use these vocalizations, they use these tree knocks and it's almost like one story that I had heard was that somebody had vocal that somebody had been close to these things they had vocalized to the point where it kind of stood the deer still. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think in a way you can relate to something like that. It's almost kind of like, you know, where we use um, scents and smells and baits to lure animals in during hunting yeah. to do it the easy way. It's kind of almost like that. It's almost kind of like a stunning type effect. So that way it gives them time to cover the ground to go after something. I mean, that... Almost like, uh, and I could be. It's kind of like a shot in the dark type of thing, but that's just kind of what my experience with that was. Well, almost like dynamite fishing. You know, you throw people to throw the dynamite in the water. It necessarily doesn't kill them. It just screws their senses up to its its easy pickings. Then, you know, with that, right. with a deer, you know. So, yeah, um, definitely a crazy and terrifying encounter. Um, we're gonna go off a little bit, guys, and. Ryan and I are going to just kind of kind of shoot the shit a little bit. We've been friends for a while and we've talked about doing podcasts and stuff. Um 
I kind of want to just talk with him and, you know, we talk a lot about reptilians, the just personal phone calls and stuff. And, you know, maybe we'll touch a little basis on some of the stuff that you're into. Uh, we'll go off course a little bit and touch bases. You've had a UFO experience. You, is, I, I've had a few. Just you, recently, though. Say. Just recently. You want to share that with us? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things like uh, uh, summer of 2019. I mean, uh, all, as a matter of fact, the weird thing was is that a lot of this started for me. I mean, I've always believed I, I, I've seen I've seen weird things in the sky. You know what I mean? That you can't quite explain. Um, but I, I lived right next to an airport. So I, I feel like I pretty much have seen all manner of helicopter of uh, fixed wing craft, you know, I mean, the president had, when, when, oh, when I think it was George Bush Sr., um, he used to fly into Portland all the time, and then they would go over to Kenny Bunk at the summer home. Yeah, to their summer home. And so, I mean, you know, the, this particular summer was just, it was one of those things that I've got a friend of mine that lives across the street, him and I have talked a lot about aliens and, you know, it is one of the first people that I could actually sit down with before I started talking to you where we could have these type of conversations. And it's just one of those things where it's like, you know, we're, we're having a conversation right out here, out in front, you know, right in the middle of the street, kind of like what I'm doing now, talking to you, just kind of wandering back and forth. And yeah, I had had a couple beers, but I've got a pretty good tolerance for that stuff, so I wasn't I wasn't messed up. I wasn't just seeing things. You know, we're talking about this type of thing, and, you know, it was weird because on cue, both of us kind of look down to the end of the street, and the best way that I can describe it is that I've got a major U.S. route running on one end of my, my little side street that I live on, but the trees are grown right up, so you really only have maybe just a little bit of a range of view and one of the biggest things we saw was something coming from one end of the trees across to the other end of the trees and it looked like it was far off but the best way that I can describe it is that if you took a school bus and you put a couple of million candle watt um, floodlights in it so all the windows were lit up and you put it in the sky that, that's kind of what it looked like cylindrical in shape you know, and then next thing you know, after that, it kind of opened the floodgates. That's when you start noticing things, um, lights in the sky. You know, this. You just, after a little while, you know what a star looks like, and you know what a star doesn't look like, you know? And right. the biggest thing for me, the most rewarding thing for me was <clears throat> one particular evening, uh, my wife, her sister, and my next-door neighbor uh, were out here. I, was, I had to work the next day, so I was sleeping. And they're out here, and she had always kind of just given me crap about, you know, like, oh, okay, that stuff doesn't exist, that type of thing, until they had their own experience. So, you know, in asking her, it's like, well, what did you see? She's like, well, basically it was like this, like, off-colored, you know, bright green light that had come over to the top of them. And this thing wasn't very high off the ground. I mean, it was... It wasn't as high up as a plane would be, which is the weird thing, but you, they really couldn't see a shape of what it looked like because the light was so bright. But it came over the top of them and slowed down and then took off at a right angle. Like, boom, gone. It's like something hit, it's like hitting the gas pedal on a dragster, how quickly it took off. It might be a, it might be a very slow analogy, but it was kind <laughs> of something like that. And, but it had this kind of like vibration to it is the best way that she could describe it. And in a lot of sightings like this, you're going to get that type of, that type of thing. You know what I mean? And it's just like, it's kind of mind blowing. I mean, <clears throat> there's a lot of weird stuff that's been going on around my area. You know what I mean? It's just hard to explain, but you just, you just know when it's real and well, what I say about real is that you know where you can make the distinction between man-made and not man-made. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's not something that's from the airport. It's something that that came from somewhere else. <laughs> well, now whether now whether um, it's Black Project stuff because uh, I remember you know Dr. Stephen Greer um, had done a lot of work on 
black budget compartmentalized craft or reverse engineering alien technology, that type of thing. And I, I myself, you know, I imagine by now people are, um, are, uh, familiar with the, uh, three videos that were released not too long ago by the Pentagon, the go fast video, the yeah. Google video and the Tic Tac video. Yep. And my personal opinion is that maybe these weren't actually alien vehicles. Maybe these were compartmentalized black budget projects. Absolutely. Because normal, normal people, normal, and when I say normal people, I mean normal people that are in the military, the Air Force, who encounter these things quite often aren't going to know about these type of projects. You know, and one of, and, you know, in watching the, the Rogan podcast with Commander David Fraber, who actually was, you know, he was right there. I mean, the, it's a Tic Tac video. He had dealt with this the day before. You know what I mean? It had actually dealt with this actual craft. Yeah. And he said the things that it did, I mean, it went from inches in front of his nose, almost took the nose off his F-18 Hornet, and then just literally just walked right away from them like if they were nothing. You know, and now you've got... um the Go Fast and the Gimbal videos, which took place in 2015, which was on the other side, I mean, because the Tic Tac was on the Pacific Coast, and the other two videos were here on the Atlantic Coast. And <clears throat> they basically acted the same way. They had the same type of characteristics. And now that I'm hearing that a lot of pilots, Navy pilots and Air Force pilots, are actually dealing with these same type of craft on a daily basis, even right now, off, you know, so many miles, you know, with the, with the battle groups that are doing their, their training here on the, you know, on the East Coast. And it's, it's kind of mind-blowing because they're seeing other things. You know what I mean? They're, I guess the way that they described it was they looked like spherical craft that had cubes in them. Right, right. Yeah, and I just found out about this information maybe about a month or two ago. Well, you and know, so I'm trying to. It, it's okay, like what you're saying with the um, man-made crafts. It, it something that fits in that category is we always figure that our our um, traveling, you know, our rockets and things are going to be very pointy, tall, cylindrical, regular rockets. Yet, Elon Musk just put a craft in space that's a huge, it looks like a huge hot water tank, you know? Like, yeah. it, it, yep. and it, it, for someone to see that going up in the air and not knowing what that is, they could mistake that for a UFO. They could be like, what the hell is that? That's not a rocket that we've created, you know? Right. And, and so, but that knowledge had to come from somewhere. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, they tapped in to these crafts that have been here previous and said, you know, well, look how this is. This looks like that, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to, travel very good but it does so you know i'm we're, we're definitely playing with um ancient ancient alien uh schematics of crafts on some of these i believe you know like the uh the blackbird the stealth bomber you know it's just it's coincidental that the stealth bomber looks just like a ufo you know like or what yeah and so we're definitely, you know, in what was it, Pentagon, a couple of months ago, they said that they've recovered crafts that were not of this earth. You know, it's yeah, just, yeah. It's, uh, well, that was just recently highlighted. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. There was an article in the New York Times. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they had printed a couple of retractions. But those retractions weren't necessarily saying, hey, we're, we're just, we're, we got our information wrong. They just literally reworded what they had said to make it more digestible, I think. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is the reason why 
a couple of things. The reason why I think that maybe these craft or black budget craft, like I could be totally wrong, but it's just some things that people had said. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of the biggest things was Bob Lazar, which I'm sure who everybody knows and knows his story, you know, that he was working with reverse engineering gravity engine propulsion system. Yep. And this is a guy that no matter what you think of him, uh, 99% of everything he said has been proven true to this day. You know, and as far as, you know, his, as far as his credentials and all that stuff, there's been people that have come out. There was a, uh, as a matter of fact, there was an interview recently um, from a UFO researcher that had talked to a man that knew, that knows Bob Lazar, had been in his house and had seen his MIT diploma hanging on the wall. You know, what a lot of people don't know is that his house was broken into not long after that, and all that stuff was taken. So in the world that we live in, especially now, you can be erased electronically. Well, if somebody wants to, even back in the day there, if somebody wanted to erase you, say the government, conspiracy, all that stuff, they could do whatever they wanted. So with Bob's, you know, the way, the biggest thing that I took from that recent documentary that Jeremy Corbell had done, you know, was the fact that how Bob described how these systems would work. And it's kind of the same thing. I, I don't know how many of you know your listeners who are going to hear this know who Ben Rich is, but Ben Rich was at one time, before he passed away, he was the lead. He basically headed up Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Yep. And he had made a comment to somebody on his deathbed that said, we've got stuff that would make George Lucas drool. We've been there, done that, or thought it wasn't worth the money to do. So does that mean that all these rumors about the you know, secret space force, like Solar Warden, all these supposed craft that we have up in the solar system, does that mean it's a BS? I mean, this is coming from a guy, you know, Ben Rich, that... This guy was very reputable. He didn't lie. He didn't bullshit. Yeah, yeah. No, well, we had, in upstate New York, there was a, uh, actually, probably five miles from where I grew up, there was a small um, Lockheed Martin plant. And literally, you, it looked like it was so militarized to even gain access like you you, there was pole lines that would run behind it and you couldn't even like they they built their fences over the pole lines and you know to where nobody could get from you know a half a mile from the building and because they were they're just building stuff that they don't want the public to know about you know and it's it's definitely a crazy thing. Um, I, we got a little bit of time left. Um, I know I want to touch on something that you and I talk about a lot, and that would be, and we actually talked about it today, and my, my listeners love the reptilians. Um, they love reptilians almost as much as Dogman and Bigfoot. Um, I am fascinated by them as well. Uh, you want to share a little info with, because I know you've got a lot of info because you're constantly reading. And where was it, the Draco system or whatever the hell it is? Well, um, <clears throat> there's a constellation of stars. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure it can change depending on where we are in the solar system. But there's the Draco constellation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's thought that these beings would come from that constellation then. Writings, I don't, I, can, I guess you could say rumors. I, I'm not really sure ancient writings, you know. That's why the destruction of history is really crappy because, you know, you don't know. A lot of stuff will get lost. And, you know, in a lot of ancient writings, you know, these these beings have been... I've heard that they come from this constellation, they've come to this planet. You know, they probably they were probably here for millions of years. I mean, apparently it's a very long-lived race. For as much as we know, there's even more that we don't know. Yeah. Um, I've been following a couple of researchers that have really gotten into the whole reptilian experience and that there might actually be some on this planet to this day. 
And there's a lot of people where, I mean, you've, I've seen YouTube videos where it looks like that these reptilians are, can mask themselves as us, kind of almost like in that TV show V, which is really, really scary for us old timers who remember that. Yeah, V was awesome, man. Well, like, Yeah, it was great. And it's just like, well, think about it. If these creatures, or these beings, I should say, have this type of technology, who's to say that they can be what they are? through hybridization or through technology they can look just like us and we wouldn't even know right right absolutely <clears throat> what's it what ike talks about them all the time man i mean it's uh i my view my i've got a theory and you know every time he, chaos and i talk we bounce crazy theories off of each other um for some reason i my theory with these portals out on the Ute Reservation near Skinwalker Ranch, oh, I think man, that has yeah. I think that has a lot to do with the reptilians. For some reason, I just have a feeling, um, because the the surgical way these animals and cows are caught up and I just, for some reason, I feel like it's the reptilians. Um, I believe a lot of different monsters or creatures come out of them from wherever, an alternate universe or whatever. But, I mean, who are we to say an alternate universe isn't part of the universe anyway? You know, it's, it's, a, big, it's a big universe. Maybe it's all connected and it's just a wormhole to a whole different area in the universe. But I, I have it for... For my, that's my theory. Is there's some sort of connection with Skinwalker Ranch and the reptilians? I I don't know why, I, but I've always felt like that. And I think Tony Robbins buying Skinwalker Ranch. I think he's a reptilian, <laughs> but <laughs> well, I mean, he's a big man. <laughs> he's, and you know, so. he just popped out of nowhere, and then he's this biggest self help guy in the world. And you know, I don't know. It's but this is the kind of conversations uh, Chaos and I have, and we've been dying to do one of these on my channel for a while together just to shoot the shit and discuss a bunch of craziness. So I kind of wanted to have his encounter kind of open a door of a, another podcast that he and I might work on down the future here, so... Well, I, I also plan to have you on the chaos effect as often as I can. Yeah. So, you know, because you, I can bring you on and have conversations about this particular subject, and you know exactly what you're talking about, and we can bounce ideas off of each other. I mean, the, the biggest, the biggest thing about all of it is the unknown. We just, we don't know. Right. It's. In, it's difficult to wrap our little brains around something like that, especially when you're talking about a technology that could be thousands to million years ahead of us. Right. And we can only think from our idea of physics and whatnot, you know? Yeah. Well, for the last couple of minutes, um, why don't you give everyone a rundown on your channel? Because um, that's where the chaos effect is. Uh, yep. let everybody know about your channel, please. And, um, then we can, we've got to end the show cause I've got a little bit of time left, but I want you to share that please. All right. Yeah. Um, I, I tell stories, you know, true stories, fictional stories, um, working on the chaos effect, which is kind of like my own deep dive into the world of ufology. Um, that type of thing, ancient civilizations. I've got another podcast on there where we talk a lot about cryptids and whatnot and the paranormal. Um, <clears throat> and I'm working on a lot of, you know, personal projects as far as, you know, original stories that I'm working on, which kind of delve into these different subjects as well. And just trying to have a little fun with it. And, you know, who knows? Uh, just trying to put out as much different content as I can, you know, between... Truth, myth, horror, science fiction, fun. You know, I, I guess it's the best way that I can describe it. And yeah, hey, if you want to come on over and let me know what you think, you like it, great. You don't like it, and that's okay, too. You know, not everybody's going to like the same thing as far as I'm concerned. Right, so. right. So it is called 
Chaos Theory Production is his channel. I know I know a few of my subscribers are subscribers of his. Um and like I said, like he just said, he 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 does fiction, but he does these podcasts as well. Um he's very talented as a narrator, very talented as a writer. Um today's Bigfoot encounter was not fiction. Um, it just happens to be that he's a very talented writer and makes fiction up as well. So um, please, guys, if that's something that you're into, go check out his channel. Um, but we are almost out of time. Ryan, or Chaos, why don't you say goodbye to everybody? Mm-hmm. All right, everybody. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you, you know, listening to me spit my story out. I appreciate it. All right, folks, I hope you all enjoyed this middle of the night or early morning bonus as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that makes this channel continue to grow and go and what makes it a place where people can share their theories, ideas, and experiences ridicule and judgment-free, just treated with the respect that we all deserve Thank you for creating a community in the comment section that is welcoming to all. Thank you. Everyone stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They're out there. They are dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions. Never stop searching for the answers. and. God bless.